Thank you everyone for joining me today. I wanna to give a special thank you to the Office of Appreciative Advising for providing me the opportunity to speak on how I take an appreciative advising approach to working with student athletes. So again, I'm honored to be here and I want to talk a little bit about my background. And so um, as mentioned before, I'm Director of Academic Support Services for Athletics at the University of St. Thomas in St. Paul, Minnesota. I have been in higher education for over 20 years as a academic counselor, athletic counselor, learning specialist, faculty advisor, instructor. And so at every opportunity I've had, I've loved to learn from my students and my colleagues. So this is another opportunity for me to Again, discuss my experiences, but also learn from you, hopefully through the Q&A and continue this conversation in the future as I provide my contact information at the end of the presentation. I was first introduced to the Appreciative Advising Institute in 2017 when I attended on campus, and it was a great opportunity for me to learn a new way of advising. For me, it was an opportunity for me to renew my love of advising, and so I've been grateful and embraced every opportunity to learn from colleagues and students as, in ways that I can grow in appreciative advising and currently in appreciative administration as well. My research interests include, and they're ever-changing, academic motivation, athletic identity, and technology and advising. So if there's other questions around that and how I use that with student athletes, I'm happy to discuss that as well. So I have created a Padlet for this presentation that I want to provide to you after the presentation, mainly because I want to be able to include other resources that may come up as we go through the Q&A. So again, I encourage you to jot down any questions that you have, put them in the chat so that I can reach those or I can talk about those at the end of the presentation. So the Padlet will have some resources that I will discuss today. It will also uh, provide you with some hands-on templates that I feel are critical for my work in uh, working with student athletes as we design and, and dream and work through the phases. So I think these resources are helpful and I hope that you find them helpful as well. So I wanna begin with a history of, a brief history of athletics. And so this is important because the landscape of athletics within the context of higher education seems to always be changing. In fact, I have a, a, a webinar later this week to talk about some upcoming changes that are happening in academic support. And so it's ever changing with different uh, Things coming up like the transfer portal is a hot topic, the mental health of our student athletes, uh, the national, um, the NLI, so name, image, likeness. So there's always things that are coming up, but I felt that it was important for us to understand where we've been in order to understand where we're going. And so I felt it was important to talk a little bit about the history and then provide you also with a resource that gives a more contemporary or modern view on where we're at. So I wanna begin with the brand 2006 article that was introduced to me years ago. This offers a perspective regarding the ongoing debate related to the perception of the place athletics holds or should hold within higher education. So Miles Brand was the fourth uh, NCAA, which is the National Collegiate Athletic Association president, but he was the first college president to take the helm of the NCAA. He took over the helm when many were criticizing the organization for their lack of valuing academics and education. And so as an academic in this article, Brand discusses the standard view, which is which this view places athletics outside of a mission of a university. And so with placing it outside of it and not part of not viewing it as part of the collegiate educational experience, this can perpetuate biases or stereotypes about athletics not being part of a university's mission, um, vision, 
And then he also talks about the integrated view. And so this view places athletics inside or part of the mission. And so in his discussion, he talks about athletics as a valuable contributor to the education of the whole student in mind, body, and spirit. And so I thought this article was timeless because even when I brought it up to my staff when we do training, they were discussing you know, our current institution and whether we fell in standard or integrated view where we were split in the middle. So it's a great opportunity for you to kind of see where that where your institution may lie in regards to that view. Um, and I also wanted to share with you a more contemporary context as related to the Navarro et al article 2020 that provides a modern perspective on the current state and role of the NCAA of athletic departments and institutions. It also highlights the influence and impact that our student athletes and athletics has is having on our institutions. And this has even changed post COVID, right? And so um, there are a lot of things to consider when you think about the history of athletics. So I want to share that with you, but also the Navarro article provides an overview of the three divisions, the athletic divisions that uh, comprise the NCAA. I know that across the world, the NCAA does not uh, govern uh, all bodies, right? So uh, there may be uh, a body in Canada or other international bodies that operate in the same way. So I wanted to provide you with understanding the divisions as well. So this article allows you to understand those divisions and how um, scholarships are distributed. So there are more scholarships offered to student athletes at D1 schools rather than no scholarships offered at D3 schools. The number of student athletes that are participating in sport varies. So there are more student athletes that are participating in sports uh, athletic departments at D1 versus D3, but also the size of these institutions are different as well. So um, that's a little bit of background as far as history. And um, as I begin the presentation and talking about the phases, I want to acknowledge, and I can't say this enough, that no student athlete population is the same across campuses across athletic departments, even across, you know, individual teams in various sports. And so this is important because when I talk about the, the phases and working through uh, and working with student athletes through these phases, I also acknowledge the fact that I have to see the individual student in front of me. I don't wanna make assumptions about the population as a whole because that puts to a detriment the students and the work that we hope to do together. So I will talk about it somewhat collectively. I'll provide some individual examples. I'll you know provide examples if you have questions about an experience that I've had, but I want to acknowledge that. And specifically in my experience, each sport has had their own culture, right? Their own culture that influences each individual member of that team. And so understanding the culture of an individual team is important to then understand how the members work together or individually as part of that team. And first speaking generally about the understanding the history of athletics within higher education, the history of athletics on your campus is also important. So what is the history of athletics on your campus? If you don't know the answer to this question, I would encourage you to learn about this key component, this informational component that NACADA, the Global Community for Academic Advising, views as a core competency that all advisors must know. So we talked about generally history, but what does it mean on your campus? How is your How are your student athletes individually impacted by the history of athletics on your campus? So I encourage you to seek learning in two areas. One, learning about the specific history, mission, vision, values, and culture of athletics on your campus. I also encourage you to learn about the characteristics, the needs, the experiences, 
of the major populations on your campus, which would include student athletes. So I found in my experience, when we talk about first gen students, we talk about low income students, um, we talk about BIPOC or uh, students of historically marginalized within higher education, student athletes are a cross section of all of these populations. And so um, understanding about their experiences across these um, different populations is important. So I do want to give you an example of the history that I needed to learn about St. Thomas. So the University of St. Thomas, I started, this will be, I'm finishing my third year here at St. Thomas. And so I first needed to understand what the history of athletics was on the campus. And so what I found was that St. Thomas was started with it's an intramural baseball um, way back in like 1895. And um, they added on, you know, football and some other sports. One of the key things I found was that St. Thomas was a key contributor to the um, Minnesota Intercollegiate Athletic Conference. So the, the MIAC or MIAC. And so they were a founding member of that conference and had been a part of that conference for years. And so, um, with that came lots of winning for St. Thomas as a D3 Division III institution. And um, that winning continued national championships. So they had a culture of winning when I arrived on campus. And so then a decision was made to shift from a D3 institution to a Division I institution. This has not been done in the history of the NCAA. And so my role was my role was to come and assist with making that transition as it pertains to academic support. So that's a whole nother webinar on how to how to start that and um, make that how we're doing with that, but um, not for today. But if um, you have questions about that, so let me know. But when I had to learn about the history and understand how that may impact different aspects of my interactions on campus with different faculty um, and with my student athletes. So we came here and we had, um, when I started, there were division three student athletes that were making a decision whether they wanted to continue as division one athletes, were they given an opportunity to do that? We had student athletes that were being recruited as the first division one class that was coming in. So there were a lot of mixed uh, populations, different demographics of our student athletes when I came here to St. Thomas. So I needed to take the time and I'm still taking the time to understand the role of athletics and how I can better support our student athletes here at St. Thomas. So my first advisor action would be for you to understand or be able to answer these questions about your yourself or your institution. So what is the history, mission, vision, values, culture? of athletics on your campus. How do you how do these how do they align with your institution's mission, vision, values and culture? So when you look at the mission of your institution, when you look at the mission of your athletic department, how do those align? Are they in sync? Are they in conflict with each other? And then you ask more questions. Why is that, right? Um, when was the last time either one was updated? Or, you know, so there's a lot of questions um, that can come from that, but it's a good place to start to understand where um, your mission, uh, how your athletic department aligns with your institution. There's also will allow you to see the structure, um, the location, position within your institution. So athletic departments are um, housed in different areas. So at my institution, I am under the provost's office. And so I have um, a boss that I report to in academic affairs. And then I have a dotted line report to athletics as well. So I kind of situate myself in both. I've been at institutions where I've worked in athletic departments that are solely housed in the athletic department that are outside of the provost's office, others that are also in the provost's office. So the experience that you might have on your institution may be because of the structure and where your athletic department is located. 
also asking yourself, what are the characteristics, the needs and experiences of the student athletes on your campus? So it's important to understand the population that you are working with, right? And so um, is there any data that you have, institutional research data that you can gain access to in regards to, um, let's see, general uh, GPA or um, demographics, where are they coming from? So at St. Thomas, the majority of students that are coming to St. Thomas are in-state or in, from the state surrounding. So I do know, let's say, geographical location. Um, some are coming from further away now that we are uh, a D1 institution. So what are the demographics and experiences of your student athletes? And then also the last one would be, um, do you have any unconscious biases in regards to student athletes? Do student athletes have any biases that may be toward faculty, staff, um, others that are other units on campus? And why might that be, right? Why might they have some of those biases? Why might you have some of those biases? And how can we work together to address that. But I think that taking the time to really think about biases from both perspectives is important because it impacts the work that we are trying to do together. And so if we are not open and um, acknowledging at least we can only we can only do the work ourselves, right? We can't do the work for others. But if we're doing the work ourselves, then that's an important step in building those relationships and the rapport with our student athletes. So I want to move forward with beginning to talk about the phases of appreciative advising. And so when I talk about these phases, I like to put myself in an appreciative mindset. In athletics, it is a fast paced world. Um, I was I was talking um, a little bit before we got on about hoping nobody knocks on my door, right? Even though I have all these signs, it is a, a high touch, um, very fast paced moving environment with something's different every day. And so what I like to do is ground myself in the appreciative mindset. I have uh, the appreciative mindset listed in my office. I have it right here by my computer and I start my day with it and I ground the end of my day with it as well. And so um, thinking about appreciative mindset, I want us to think about um, caring about and believing in the potential of each student that we work with, possessing an attitude of gratefulness, continually honing our craft, which each of you is here today to do that. And I, again, I appreciate you being here. Remembering your power. I will talk a little bit more about that and how um, I work to lessen that authority figure in my work with um, student athletes. Be insatiably curious about your student stories. I will talk again about the discover phase, which is my favorite phase where I can learn so much about my students and be culturally aware and responsive. So when I talked about the cultures within teams that um, doesn't even touch on the individual backgrounds of our, our student athletes. So thinking about and being culturally aware in the work that we do. So in talking about the disarm phase, this is an important phase when we think about working with students. And so the summary of this phase would be making a positive first impression with students to create a safe and welcoming environment. How do we do that? And so I provided some of the key features of this phase, which are um, providing a warm welcome, creating a safe and comfortable environment, appropriate self-disclosure, and appropriate nonverbal behavior. And so now I wanna talk a little bit about how this may work with, or how I use it with student athletes. So I have on each slide highlighted an area that I think is important and I wanna make sure that I get to and discuss. As I mentioned before, our unit is a high touch unit, which means that our offices are located within our study space. So we have a study hall that our students are required to attend. And so when we have multiple students, 200 students, you're so you know uh, coming through, um, 
sometimes each day, depending on what time of the year it is. Um, but we have um, our ability to be in contact with our students on a constant basis. So if we need to talk to them about something, if we need to connect with them, we are able to do that. This may not be the case for everyone on this call, but um, it is what we are um, what we are able to do and allows us to, I think, disarm our students in different ways. So one of the ways that I disarm my students is not even with a meeting, right? They don't have a meeting with me. I am in the space and I'm walking around and I'm getting to know the students that are in you know, study hall that may be coming through to some of our athletic offices. So being around and being visible is important and also practices, right? We go to practices and have our students see us in their space, right? They always come to our space, but they also need to see us uh, in their space as well. So I would encourage you to go to practices and working um, with those teams that you may work with or individual student athletes that may be in your classes, go to practice, go to games, um, make sure that they see you. When we do have uh, meetings with students, um, I, I have to, I want to talk about encouraging the drop-in culture, right? So I have found that in working with student athletes, they enjoy stopping by. I think it is the, the nature of their schedules and they try to fit in time when they can, right? And so they are usually up very early and they go, our study hall closes at nine o'clock. There are some across the country that close even later um, and they're trying to fit in um, tasks that they know they need to do. And so um, we do have a drop-in uh, policy. I do encourage appointments. I would encourage that. Not everybody can do a drop-in culture, but that is something that student athletes do. And I think that allows them to be more comfortable with poking their head in, right? And um, asking that quick question, you know, my availability, right? They know that I'm available. My door is open, then I'm available. Right now my door is closed. I'm not, I have a ton of signage saying don't enter, right? Um, so they understand that dynamic. Also asking them about their sport. So when I meet a new student athlete, it's a first year student that I might have had some minor contact with in recruiting or during orientation, summer orientation. The first time I meet with them, I ask them about their sport, right? Um, and so that's some of the conversation that we have. Um, and I let them lead with how much they want to tell me, how little they want to tell me. Um, I use sport as an opportunity to learn about them as well. And so I'll talk a little bit about athletic identity in a little bit. Um, I think it's important for you to describe your role to them in the disarm phase so they understand what role, what perspective that you are going to provide for them. Um, they have a lot of people around them that have different roles. So there's a lot of support in athletics and that's some of that is mandated by the NCAA. And so they have coaches, they have um, sports medicine staff. Sometimes some will um, have doctors they need to see, nutritionists, sports psychologists, strength and conditioning people. So they have different people that are in their lives. And so helping to explain what your role is and um, the role that you play on campus is helpful. And then as far as um, appropriate self-disclosure, your experience with sport, right? So bridging that gap is, I think, a way, talking about your experience with sport is a way to bridge a gap that might be there. So talking to them about your experience with sport, and it's okay if there's not any, right? Um, I don't know about all sports. I don't know about all rules. I, I, I'm eager to learn. And so I ask my students about that. And so um, that is a way that I think gets quieter uh, student athletes to talk. It allows them to see me as in a role that's different than the coaches they may um, come in contact with on a more regular basis. It opens the space for student athletes to guide the conversation. They take me where they want. Um, and so then that will open up the next phase, which is the discover phase. So the discover phase is summarized as asking generative questions, open-ended questions that help advisors learn about student strengths, 
passions and skills. This is my favorite um, phase because I love to ask questions. Um, my husband loves is glad I'm in the job that I am. So I ask all my questions and then he doesn't get so many questions at home. Um, but I do love to ask uh, questions of uh, the students that I work with. And so um, when you think about the this phase and uh, the key features of this are, again, open-ended questioning, attending, attending, uh, attending and behavior, uh, attending behavior and active listening, and strength-based story reconstruction. And so some of the differences here that are particular to student athletes is you can begin to hear about the, the strength of their athletic identity. And so for athletic identity, for those that may not know, and I've included some um, articles about athletic identity, it is thinking about general identity, a clinic, clear uh, definition of themselves, um, comprised of goals and values to which a person is strongly committed. And so thinking about this in the athletic realms, it's something that they have committed a lot of time to. It is uh, an identity that may be more salient for them most of the time. Um, and so you can, through conversation and discussion with student athletes, learn about the strength of their athletic identity, which I think will impact your future conversations. So there are those that have, you know, high, medium, and low um, athletic identity. And so um, I'll talk a little bit about an assessment to um, to help with that. But the main part of the Discover is listening to their stories. The training that I have is allowing a student to guide me where they want to go. And so through their stories, they will take me to various different places. Um, some students will tell me their whole life story in one sitting. Others, it takes semesters to really understand who they, who they are and how I can best support them. And so I feel like I'm always in this phase, the discover phase. Um, and so I allow for those stories to develop. And some of the questions that I ask um, students are related to um, what brought you here to St. Thomas. So that allows me to see, was it academics versus sport? Was it proximity to home? Or was it sport, right? Was there something else other than sport that brought them here? Or is it primarily related to sport? I ask them, how did they begin right in their, in their sport if they haven't shared that? Um, if they weren't participating in their sport, what would they be doing? So that takes me down another path of, I wish I would have been this, or I want to be this. And so, um, we also talk about in this discover phase, the open communication with coaches, right? So in athletics, we do have open communication with coaches. Um, and it's important for me in this phase to set the stage for that balance between privacy and sharing with their support team. And I mentioned some of those other people in regards to their support team, but it helps me to learn and start that conversation with them, build that relationship as we continue to, um, as I continue to ask questions and um, ask them different, different things that they may bring up. And so um, some of the things that I've discovered about students is that they, I'd say an example of a student that took a little bit more time to open up for me was they indicated that a student the that me, uh, a student that um, was really unsure of whether or not this institution was uh, the best fit for them. And so we talked through that and it took several times for me to meet with them to understand how I could best support them. And, you know, unfortunately, the student decided that this institution was not the best fit for them, and they ended up transferring. Um, but again, taking that time to hear their stories and not 
assume that the path is going to take them down, take you down sport. Um, it may lead you right to now. other places. Uh, and in that story reconstruction and thinking about what you're hearing, it allows you to highlight those other identities that are non-athletic identities as well. So you can learn more about the strength of their athletic identity, but also what other identities are present that they may need your help with getting um using uh, being more present so um let's say academics right so academics may not be you know the most salient um, identity for some student athletes for others it is right um and so it does allow you to see their different identities by listening through to their stories so this is the um aims so the athletic identity measurement scale that i wanted to share um with you as a way to gauge uh the athletic identity of the student that is sitting in front of you so this is a short uh, scale that a short um measurement that you can use. I do not typically hand over measurements for students to circle and that I don't do that, but um, having some of these questions in your mind, um, you may be able to ask them, um, do they consider themselves a student or an athlete, right? The hope as an academic advisor, they say both, they say both, right? Um, but for some, they will say athlete. I'm only here to play my sport. Right. And so what do we do with that? How do we how do we help them to um, bring out that other side that we know is in there um, that they just may need a little bit more time to to develop and gain confidence in? So this is a scale, a seven point scale um, that you the higher the rating, the stronger their athletic identity. And so you do have access to this as well in the Padlet. So I want to talk about the the dream phase next, which is inquiring about students' hopes, dreams for their future. So when you think about the the dream phase, it is important to consider a couple things. And um, when I when I talk to students about their uh, their dreams, I one of the questions I ask them is if you were paid to do anything what would it be? And I make sure I say not sleeping, right? So they would say, oh, I'd sleep, you know, but um, if you could be paid to do anything, right, what would that, what would that be? And so um, that could be a variety of different things. And um, the other thing that I do that I think is important, so for student athletes, many of them visualize a lot of their movements, a lot of their, um, their sessions there. So that helps to, uh, promote muscle memory and so the mind and body working together. So I use visualization to ask them to visualize the process or path that they may need to get there. And so sometimes after they have visualized it, we can get it on paper. So what does it look like? What does that path look like on paper? It could be, um, you know, kind of some lines drawn with clusters of things. It could be, you um, it could be more concrete steps and goals that they have, but helping them to first visualize it, I think is something that is unique for our student athletes because they are often visualizing within their, um, their sports. And then considering their dreams, we have to think about whether their dreams include sport or not, right? Um, do they have pro opportunities, professional sport opportunities, and is that part of their dream? And so this may be unique, again, to your campus. Do all of your sports on your campus have opportunities to um, go to that next level of professional sports? Uh, very few do, but I, you know, there are some sports on my campus where there are opportunities for that. And so when we talk about their dreams, we think about those things as well um, and professional opportunities. So for example, when I was dreaming or going through a dreaming practice with a, a student athlete whose dream had a lot of different um, pieces to it. So the first was, I would say the highest dream was to go to the NFL. And so we acknowledged that the next one was um, being an education major. 
but the real dream was to be a barber. And so we got through those other dreams to get to the the one he said, the real one, um, which was a barber. And so then we had another conversation about that academic path um, at St. Thomas and what that may look like for him. So in talking about the design phase, there are a couple pieces with this. So the design phase, it, it does allow you to be creative and I, I love that. Um, but I, I wanna acknowledge there are some influential factors in thinking about the design phase. One, we have to acknowledge the transfer portal and its influence on athletics. And so the transfer portal is um, an NCAA uh, space where students would, may be interested in leaving an institution and going to another institution and how might that impact the design that you have for them or that you put, you co-create together. And so when you think about the designing of the plans, it is a co-creation of a concrete, incremental, achievable goals that makes the students' dreams that you learned about um, previously come to life. And so for the academic plans or the design, um, when you're thinking about student athletes is I try to ask them, well, who is, you know, their academic coach, right? So who is the person that is a motivator for them? Who is their cheerleader? Who is the first person they may call when they do something well, when they win or something, you know, they pass an exam? Who is that person that they, they might call? So who is that person that motivates them? Also, we talk about um, how can you win and achieve in your goals, right? So again, we're using those sport references that will help to connect, help them to make that transferable connection from their sport to the plan that you are co-creating. The other is being mindful of the other, there are competing plans that may be out there, right? There may be coaches that want a student to stay an extra year, or there may be parents that want them to go pro now or, you know, whatever. So we have to acknowledge that there may be some alternative plans out there that may or may not be the student's true plan or interest um, that they want to pursue. And the most important, I think, for, for me, at least in my experience, is collaborations across campus. It is important that we collaborate across campus for our student athletes. And so I did provide an article um, from Ruben and Lewis 2020 that talks about how the, some of the research about collaborations, what that looks like as far as communication and that. But when you're thinking about designing a plan, I talked about there are some other things that we have to consider. And so there are two things that I want to present to you. The first is, again, if you have an academic plan or other dream plan that you are working with a student, you want to think about where they're at in their experience at the institution. And so um, I have a, uh, the four-year plan that I use is here. Can you see that? Let's see. Okay, so the four-year plan that I have, and you can have access to this, is a, uh, oops, disappeared, is, let me see if I can get it back out. The four-year academic plan that I use with uh, students is something that will allow you to plan out their four years while also incorporating um, their own, you know, desires as far as other minors, majors, things like that. Um, this is something that I start with the students, but I give it to them to adjust or change. You'll see that this is an Excel document. It allows them to duplicate and add different sheets, so different um, parallel plans that they may have and that they're interested in um, pursuing is provided as well here and gives them an opportunity. One of the things that you'll see on this sheet is uh, the credits, and you'll see that um, you'll see these percentages um, as far as 40, 60, and 80, and those are related to NCAA progress toward degree requirements. And so I want to share that with you as well. So when I'm thinking about planning with student athletes, I have to consider 
that there are other requirements that they need to meet in order to remain eligible at their institution. Again, I know that there are a lot of different um, advisors, staff administrators from across the world on here. And so uh, the NCA is our governing institution. However, you may have another institution or governing body in your uh, province or uh, country that has other requirements similar to this. So I would encourage you to create a guide like this that you can share with people across campus, that you can share with coaches, um, faculty members. Um, there's not an expectation that everyone learn these requirements, but it is a helpful guide when student athletes are communicating to you about, well, I can't do this, or I have to have 12 credits and those types of things. It's a, it's a way for you to understand what some of the restrictions that they are aware of that they are working within when we are co-creating plans for them. So as we think about the designing uh, of the plans and other things that we need to consider, we now enter the deliver phase. And so I think about using this phase as ways to make connections to sport that um, emphasize transferable thinking and goals uh, so the students can deliver on their goals. So some of the key features that we work in as well as motivating and energizing our students to be the best and engendering academic hope, ending our conversation well and following up. So one of the things that I do with my students at the end of a conversation is ask them, do they need anything from me? And so that is my way of ending a conversation well. Um, and then we follow up with an email. So we document what the conversation that we had. Um, and again, I asked them, do they have any additional questions? So we are clear on what the expectations are as we enter this deliver phase. When I think about connections to sport and emphasizing transferable thinking, again, I do love sport. I, I hope to learn about all different types of sport. Um, and so in that, I try to work in um, terms that a student may be able to relate to when we're asking them to deliver. So for example, I'll give you an example of a, a baseball player um, came into my office and he is at the point where he is graduating and is, is, is kind of... Um, concerned has some uh, his confidence and can he finish his last semester so when he came in and I, I talked about him being in his ninth inning this is the ninth inning of your academic career and you're up to bat right this is you this is your time to finish and I was like you may knock it out of the park right you may hit a home run or you may get that base hit that scores that run right that you need um but you are going to go up to bat and you are going to succeed. You are going to finish. And so um, sometimes I try to incorporate whatever the sport may be so that they can, it may be a, a better connection for them than trying to describe it um, in you know a more academic way. So that is a way that I try to make those connections to sport to help them see those transferable um, skills. And so the last phase I want to talk to you about today would be the don't settle phase. And so this phase is um, where students and advisors set up their own internal bars and expectations, and they continue to challenge and support. They raise the bar. Um, they create a virtuous cycle of um, positive restlessness and understanding um, your pocket of, of greatness as an advisor, as a student. And so what I try to do in the don't settle phase is capitalize on their winning spirit. So um, most student athletes want to win, right? So how can they succeed at accomplishing the goals that they've set forth? I do ask them, I ask them about um, how do they reset, right? We've gotten to the end of a, um, 
a season or we're starting a new season, how do you reset to continue to be motivated to move forward, to um, do the play over again? Um, and then what motivates you to keep going, right? So is there something that is maybe non-sport related that motivates you to keep moving forward? Um, is it the challenge, right? You like the challenge um, and overcoming those obstacles. So let's, you know, identify what those challenges are, create a plan to move forward, but we want to keep on um, keeping keeping moving, moving, even if it's a little bit in the direction of um, continue to deliver on the goals and plans that we set. And so this is an opportunity for you to celebrate their wins. Um, did they show up to study hall? Yes. Did they turn in assignments this week? Yes. Did you attend classes this week? Great. Now, how do we put it in place? How do we motivate you to do it again tomorrow, to do it again next week. And so these are some of the conversations um, that I have. Um, I love to celebrate wins. I don't think people celebrate themselves enough. So this is an opportunity for um, us to do that in the don't settle phase. So there is a, another action item that I have for advisors, and I've talked about throughout this presentation, the competitive spirit and using sport as a, um, a guide to connect and uh, challenge, motivate, um, help your student athletes succeed. But I also want to acknowledge that at any point, if you sense that the competitive or winning spirit is not there, then you need to follow that path and understand why it's not there, right? So what else is going on with the student? And so I provided some things that may be um, happening with the student athlete that may um, shift the plan or it may um, make the, the plan that we discussed or how you connect with the student a little bit different. So um, are they no longer interested in their sport? Right? Are they transitioning out of their sport? Are they graduating? Sport has been a part of their lives for a long time. Now they're not going to have it. Or were they for forced to do without or be without their sport um, due to an injury they sustained? So um, studying psychology of um, injury um, is a, a thing that student athletes are, is real for them. It's something they experience. The team dynamics on your on the, uh, the team, what's going on with that? Is there a new coaching change, right? Um, is, are there particular issues within the team that are causing a distraction or could be contributing to mental health concerns as well? And so um, I do acknowledge that the description that I provided is that we, we capitalize on their winning and competitive attitude, um, their spirit, but we also acknowledge that not every student athlete is the same their path may be different. They may be experiencing different things. And so it's important to pause and allow that student to guide you again where they want to be by listening to their story, which may take you down another path. So as I wrap up, I want to leave you with um, some next steps in thinking about what we've talked about today. Um, most important or one of the most important things would be understanding the history of athletics on your campus. So starting there, what do I know about that? What do I need to know about that? How does that influence um, my work with um, my student athletes or their experiences on campus? Also, do you have any unconscious biases about student athletes? How might those be addressed? Also thinking about it from the other perspective. What biases may student athletes bring into your office based on their experiences on campus or prior to arriving on campus? I think it is so important, again, the discover phase is where I love to be, is listening to students' stories, taking the time to disarm them and listen to their stories. We are not in a hurry, not in my office, we're not. The world is kind of athletics is going around me, but it's a slow time for me. I take the time to listen to their stories so I can support them the best way that I can. Be mindful of other regulations, other constraints on their time. I talk here about the NCAA Conference League or other guidelines that you may have that put restrictions on um, the plans that you may co-create with the student athletes. 
And I think being authentically you, that's all I do every day is being me. Um, perfectly imperfect is what um, we talk about, you know, an appreciative advising. And I embrace that, right? We are all learning. And um, I would encourage you, there's a lot that we talked about today. Uh, pick a phase, pick an area. Maybe you need to learn about the history and you sit there for, you know, a month or two, but pick a phase from what we've talked about and how can you incorporate some of the suggestions, um, that I provided. I'll also put some of the questions that I talk, um, that I provide to students um, that I didn't share here today in my um, Padlet. But again, thank you everyone. Contact me if you have questions. I love to talk about sport. Um, I love to talk about students. It is my life's calling. Um, I love the work that I do and I am hoping that we can connect in the future. Thank you. Thank you so much, Michelle. I know, I don't know if you're able to see everyone, but can we give Michelle just a round of applause, drop it in the chat? Like, wow. Wow. You did an amazing job. I love how you situated how, where college athletics was, where it is today, and how you have adjusted using the framework to uh, your uh, student athletes. And so we've had some amazing questions drop in the chat. We're going to do a short Q&A session, but before we do that, I just have a few brief announcements from the Office of Appreciative Education. And so I'm just gonna go ahead and go through that here real quick. So Ashley's going to drop a few links in the chat for us, uh, but please bookmark our homepage. A lot of you were asking in the chat about resources, specifically the Padlet from this webinar, the recording, and we make all of this stuff available on our website. So please bookmark our website. We will also email you once this recording has been uploaded as well as the Padlet and the PDF version of the slide deck. We will make you aware of that once it becomes available. As well as you were talking about the don't settle phase, Michelle, I'm always brought back to gaining feedback and getting um, folks' perspectives and experiences. And so Ashley's dropping in the chat a link to a short feedback form for our webinar today, and we'll share this out with Michelle, but please take a few minutes to fill out this form. Help us not settle and continue to make our webinar series even better. Again, we've been offering these webinars since spring of 2020, and we're always trying to find new ways to innovate, to be on the cutting edge, and to meet all of your needs. So thank you so much for filling out that feedback form. As well, this is the second webinar in our spring 2024 free webinar series. Our last webinar will be April 9th. Focus on appreciative onboarding, utilizing appreciative education in onboarding practices. Registration is live on our website right now. Um, and please go in and register for our free webinar and end our webinar series this spring with us here on April 9th. As well, summer is right around the corner, y'all. And we love the summertime because that's when we have our live virtual appreciative advising institutes. This summer, we have three different options that we're offering all are the same. We just have three different options for you to choose from, one in May, one in June, and one in July. Each of our appreciative advising institutes are utilizing small groups led by experienced appreciative advisors like Michelle Smith-Ware to lead small groups in discussions around appreciative advising and to learn all the tenets of the six phases of appreciative advising. And then finally, a special announcement from the Office of Appreciative Education. We are really excited on the back end for this. We are hosting our virtual Appreciative Advising Conference 2, the second ever Appreciative Advising Conference we are hosting next January 10th, 2025. We will have more information coming on our website shortly, but please mark your dates, save the dates. We look forward to seeing you join us for our virtual Appreciative Education Conference. And then with that, Michelle, again, we've had just a few questions pop into the chat, and I'd love to pick your brains here uh, just for a second. One question that we had is, how do you get professors to understand the demands that student athletes have and that they're not just trying to skip a class? Um, they have schedules, like their game schedule or the bus schedule to get two games that are constantly changing and moving. So how do you help professors understand those demands um, on student athletes? 
Yes, I think this is a continual um, conversation or a question that comes up and talking to different colleagues ac across the country. Um, it matters right at your institution. So we are um, in year three, finishing year three of our transition to D1. So we are fairly new. And um, in my experience, you have to hit it from several angles. There are definitely university policies that um, attendance policies that are, you know, in place or hopefully that are in place or may need to change so that you can better support your student athletes and their ability to represent your institution when they are traveling away. Um, another thing that I've done is I have gone on a speaking tour, right, of who I am, what my unit does, uh, what we do to encourage our student athletes to have conversations early, travel letters, getting those out as early as possible, um, providing templates for our student athletes to begin those conversations or those communications with our faculty members. Um, but at the end of the day, we can only do so much, right? I can't change the mind of my faculty members. Um, I try to um, overload them with love and support and under help them to understand that we are on the same page and that we are um, we have the same goal for our student athletes, which is to graduate. And so how can we be partners in that conversation? How can we par be partners in that process? Um, so I do think it's an ongoing um, debate. It varies based on your institution, the history. Do you have a long history of athletics? and supporting student athletes on your campus or are you new and just developing? So that may look different, um, but those are my thoughts on um, that. And if anybody has a quick fix, I am, sign me up, email it to me, but I haven't found it. Um, there's different ways to approach it. I appreciate that, Michelle. Thank you. Another question, you were in the disarm, disarm phase. You were talking about student athletes having a study hall and how they come and they have this study hall. Do you have any feedback about this uh, study hall? Is it required for student athletes? If so, how do you make it required? Um, and how has it been? How has it uh, been effective on your campus? So there are academic resources that are mandated by the NCA to provide to student athletes. And so this is one of the academic resource unit, which is myself, um, and a way for student athletes to make sure that they are getting their study in. So one of the ways that we do, we focus on our first year students. And so primarily our first year students. So our first year students have six hours of required study hall and required means they swipe in, we track their hours. Um, we also, this is an opportunity for us to um, see how they are interacting in the space. So we are learning about their learning habits, right? Um, do, are they on their phones more than they are actually studying? Are they um, sleeping? Are they talking to their friends? So we have um, a way to um, see how they are interacting in the space in hopes that when they are out of study hall, so in their spring semester, second semester, they can reduce their hours based on their institutional GPA. And so uh, most of our first years will go down to three hours. We will cut them in half. Um, and and then we do have some upperclassmen that do need additional support. Um, but our goal is to get our students out of study hall. And it's mandated because of the conversations we have with our coaches. So they understand that athletics does not happen without academics. And so the student athletes need a space to study. Um, they need the time for us to commit to support them. And so the study hall structure that we have allows for that to happen. I appreciate that. I also recognize that it is just about four o'clock on the East Coast here. We still have a few more questions that I'd like to get through, but I also just want to recognize time here for folks on the call. Again, we have a few uh, other questions that we're going to touch on, but just taking a note at the time, it's almost the top of the hour. And so, Michelle, you've mentioned a Padlet and we, you've shown me this Padlet and we're going to share it with folks afterwards. What are some things folks can expect to be on this padlet of resources that um, we're gonna share out with them. So on the padlet, I, I love articles, I love research. Um, and so I have uh, an area that has talked about background. So the, the, my, the brand article that I shared, the Navarro et al article, there's also the NCA manual for this year that's on there. And I want you to um, peruse article 14, which is the academic eligibility. So that's where my unit sits. Again, you don't have to know everything about it, but 
helping to understand the context and conversations we have with student athletes, again, about other structures that are in place to support them. I do have um, a graphic on there as well, as far as the divisions in the US. Um, so those are the NCAA divisions that um, provide kind of a, a snapshot of where student athletes are um, and how scholarships are distrib distributed in that. Um, I have a couple articles on athletic identity. I am waiting on one more article. I have it in print. I have not gotten it. I need to get it in PDF, um, but that is the foundational seminar article, at least for athletic identity that I studied in graduate school um, that I um, will put on there. So I do have those articles and also um, the templates that I shared. So the um, four-year planning template, as well as the NCA academic uh, progress for degree template, um, and also the collaboration across campus for student athlete success article is on there as well. I want to include uh, questions that I did not get to um, that I asked student athletes in different phases. So I will put that on there as well. I appreciate that, Michelle. And you know, that sets up my next question here. You talked about that four-year plan and that template that you have on there. Um, and knowing that you have, you're working at a D1 school, uh, thinking about folks that are at other division schools, such as D2, D3, uh, community college, uh, junior college. Um, if you, do you have any suggestions of changes that you would make to that four-year plan based on any of the different things, let's say a community college that works with student athletes, any suggestions on changes you would make, or how would you navigate that uh, template in a community college setting with student athletes? So the four-year plan template, depending on um, community college, is usually two years. So I would, um, depending on what, again, is included or not, um, do they have any credits coming in? You can leave that on there. You can take off um, the final two semesters. We do have student athletes that come from junior colleges, from community colleges. Um, so um, I would use it in that way. There are always requ academic requirements. So start with your institution. What are your academic requirements? You can update that grid to include your academic specific requirements. So on my sheet, I have 129 credits to graduate. You could adjust that to make sure it meets your credits to graduate. Um, so there's a lot of different ways that you can use it. Um, you can also use the next tab to kind of parallel the plan in the semester and what actually items you have for the student in that semester. So that's more of a qualitative um, document that you can do as well. So you have two sheets, you have the, the academic plan that is, you know, the course numbers and the credits. And then the other plan that you could parallel that to would be action items, goals for each semester that you have for um, student athletes. So there's a variety of ways that you can use it. The NCAA document, uh, the the progress toward degree document would be changed a bit um, for division three. It's my understanding that they don't have the progress toward degree. It's more of passing uh, 24 credits. And so that is a different way that you could um, change that up. But again, looking at the restrictions, the require academic requirements that you have at your institution, at uh, your league level, um, you can adjust those, those documents. I'll make sure they are, um, adjustable. They're PDFs right now, but I can make them so you can edit them. We appreciate that, Michelle. Thank you. We have three more questions here. And so you talked a little bit about your student uh, demographics of going from a D3 to a D1 school and how that's impacted uh, their recruiting process. Uh, one of our questions was, when what percentage of your student athletes are from the United States? Just a general bar ballpark. I know hockey is a big sport at, at the University of St. Thomas here. So just a ballpark, like are majority of your students from the United student athletes from the United States or how does that demographics shape, uh, shake out? Right. So I talked a little bit about the history. So as a D3 institution, a lot of the students were coming from the state of Minnesota or Wisconsin. You have Iowa um, and so the Dakotas. So they were coming from the local areas. And so that was a higher concentration. As we have shifted to D1 athletics, we do have more international students coming in. Um, however, the number is not um, 
it's it's a small percentage for our student athletes, but it is increasing. We do have an increased number of students that are coming from outside the local area. So East Coast, uh, West Coast, the South. Um, so our demographic is changing, but primarily it is remaining local um, to the Minnesota um, surrounding areas. But the intention of the shift to D1 is to see that shift, which I am seeing it in some of my teams, but not all of my teams as far as more international presence. Great, I appreciate that. Um, you talked a little bit about uh, connecting with student, your student athletes. Do you offer uh, student athletes ways to connect with you after hours, such as through email or phone number? How do you navigate that barrier there of um, professional Michelle and uh, personal Michelle getting contacted by student athletes? Yes. I tell them about my family, right? So I have a competitive gymnast that on the weekends during season, we are everywhere, right? So they understand the commitment of that. Um, I under They understand boundaries too. So I'm clear about, um, I need you to be timely in your emails to me and not expect for me to reply. If you send me something Friday night at 10 p.m., I'm not gonna possibly, if it's not, if it's not an emergency, I'm not going to reply until Monday. Um, we do have non-traditional hours. So for example, I work study hall until 9 p.m. on Mondays and Thursdays, and my staff members also take other days. So we allow some of that flexibility of being available um, non-traditional hours um, so that our students can access us. Zoom is great. I have Zoom on my phone. I have it, you know, on um I mean, my computer, of course, we're on there right now. Um, so using that as a way to communicate my cell phone, uh, I don't typically give out my cell phone information except for um, students that I feel do need a little bit extra support. But again, I put limits on that. We do have a texting software that we can use through our institution. And so it is a texting way of communicating. And uh, we have Teamworks. And so that allows us also to communicate with our student athletes while also preserving our personal information. So um, there are some students that do not understand boundaries. And so I use that as a teachable moment. I take every moment to have a teachable moment um, and in inform the students that I'm not accessible all the time. Faculty are not accessible all the time. You need to plan better um, so that you can get the information that you're requesting in a timely manner. I appreciate that, Michelle. And our final question, I know we have some colleagues on the call here who are very in-depth with the uh, with research around thriving and student thriving and how thriving in one area impacts other areas. And so, Michelle, I'm wondering in your experiences, um, wh what do you do to emphasize how the advising process goes and to increase a student athlete's academic performance? Um, and do you see that translating to their athletic performance outside? So can you say that again for me? Yeah, of course. What, uh, what do you do to emphasize uh, how the advising process goes for student athletes mm -hmm. to enhance their academic performance? Um, and then do you think that by enhancing their academic performance or how does it correlate to their athletic performance? As I, I mentioned before that we explain to our students the connection between the two. So um, you cannot have your student is before athlete for a reason, student athlete, right? So that is the primary reason you are in an institution of higher ed. And so that should take the lead. Um, if you are not performing in the classroom, then you cannot even step on the field, ice court, whatever that may be. And so we have conversations about that. I can't speak to um, the correlation between academics to athletics. I see it more so coming from doing well in athletics. They are continuing to do well in academics. And so um, let's say, for instance, I talked about injury. If a student athlete is injured and they have a high athletic identity, and that is that sport is taken away for them, forcibly taken away. We do see some students experience um, loneliness, um, questioning, you know, if they belong on their team, what's their role now. Um, they do, some of them, you know, 
are, you know, depressed. Um, and so that's where we have to closely monitor that and uh, keep them engaged in both aspects because if one's going great, typically the other one's going great. So uh, we just look for some of those red flags. Um, and so we do get information about student athletes that are injured. Um, so sometimes I have to communicate out medical information, um, not in-depth medical information, just the student is missing class because of a medical situation. Um, and so the fact that we get that information allows us to provide additional support for students that may be um, away from their sport for whatever reason that may be. So again, I don't typically see it academics to athletics, but I see it athletics affecting their academics. Awesome. I appreciate that, Michelle. And again, thank you so much for saying yes uh, to the Office of Appreciative Education and hosting this webinar series. I thank you, everyone who joined today. We're going to make this recording available sometime Friday afternoon, and we will notify you once that recording is available, as well as the Padlet. So again, Michelle, thank you, thank you, thank you. On behalf of the Office of Appreciative Education, can we, can we give Michelle a round of applause? Thank you. <laughs>